Ari, I want to just again acknowledge what how much Ari contributes and enriches our lives by organizing these opportunities and how you, Ari, do your homework. In fact, the title of this particular conversation, Creating Eternal Moments, is taken from an article that Ari read that he'll clearly share the link in his follow-up from New York Jewish Week uh, 12 years ago. So this is a moment for all of us to spend with Rabbi Matalon to get to know him. Many of us are not his members, but the fact that his members are tuning in is one indication of how beloved he is by those who know him best. For many of us, this is the opportunity to get to know you, Roli. For me, it's the treat to get to know you better. Since the topic is creating eternal moments, Perhaps we can begin with you defining what is for you an eternal moment. Thank you, uh, Eli, and thank you, uh, Ari. I think it's, uh, I'm very, very happy to be here and uh, share some thoughts uh, with, uh, with all of you, some ideas, some thoughts, some of my experience, and I hope it will contribute to your, to your journey, to your spiritual growth. Um, in whichever way it may hopefully make a difference for the better. So eternal moments, I, I you know, I believe that um, that the Jewish pursuit, you know, as a spiritual pursuit, is really to to connect ourselves to heaven. You know, we we live, we've been placed here on earth. We sort of. You know, we have a connection to earth, we have a connection to heaven, we are sort of in between worlds, and and we often forget that we are in between worlds, we inhabit, you know, the material, physical world, we are in our sort of daily pursuits, and, and lose the awareness, the consciousness of where we come from in terms of, you know, of our origin, in terms of being made in the image of God, and being connected to God, and to, and to have a soul that is connected above and we forget that, and and Judaism is a constant reminder that that's where we come from, and that's where our soul comes from, and that we're connected, and that we have to aspire to live a little bit more in that dimension. We can't escape, and we should not escape our earthly nature and condition because that's who we are, and we have to to live in it and not escape it, but to try to you know as Hasidic masters have said, you know, to try to elevate things, to try to bring things up, to connect them to not to what's above. And so I think, you know, part of our our spiritual pursuit is is to make those connections, to live in that dimension as much as we can. You know, by 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 studying, by praying, by being in community, by by doing, by loving, by making justice in the world. Uh, behaving in righteous ways, we can, you know, I think, elevate things, connect them above. That's where the roots are, you know, of the of the soul, are above, not below. So, so when I, you, I, you know, connecting ourselves to eternity in that way, something beyond ourselves. So when you think of connecting to that, which is eternal, now we're going to go to the beginning of getting to know how you came to be Rabbi Matalon. Is there an early memory that you have that awakened you to this desire to develop a connection to eternity? Yes, look, I, I grew up my, uh, in a family of Syrian Jews. My, all my grandparents came from that part of the world. Uh, and uh, they were very connected to their Jewish roots and also to their roots as uh, Sephardic Jews or Mizrahi Jews. And, um, and I, you know, I was very uh, close with my grandfather. And, um, and, and I would go with him and my grandmother, actually, we would go to, to prayer services together when it was in the Sephardic uh, Syrian synagogue, I was sitting next to my grandfather, and I was completely mesmerized by the music. Of course, I didn't understand the words, but I tried to follow. I listened to his voice. I tried to follow in the prayer book. He would point with a finger. And, and I was just very, very um, 
I think, uh, transposed, transported by the experience, you know, of these chants and these melodies and uh, and people praying and uh, all the kids, you know, at some point, particularly in long services like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the kids will go play outside and I didn't want to go play outside, I stayed inside. So that was the beginning. I mean, there was something there that was very, very attractive to me. I, I, I couldn't name it, you know, at the time. But there's something, the connection to these melodies, to these words, to a tradition, to, to Hebrew, to God, to prayer. I mean, it was something that really spoke to me from a young age. And then later on, my grandparents became active in, uh, in who became my mentor, synagogue, Marshall, Rabbi Marshall Meyer, who was a young American uh, rabbi who had gone to Argentina when he was 29, 30 years old. Eventually, a couple of years later, he founded his own synagogue, uh, which became a, um, a very attractive place for a lot of young people uh, and old people as well, but the, but they, they were a singularly a synagogue that had a lot of young people there, and uh, in many cases, children brought their parents. I was brought in by my grandparents, but in many cases, the children brought their parents in, and um, it was a very alive and active and passionate uh, prayer experience, and there was a lot of other activities there. It was very compelling, and um, so I grew up with you know, part of my uh, sort of going to services there with my grandparents. I sat between my grandmother, and my grandfather every Friday night there for Kabbalah Shabbat. And then occasionally my I would go with my grandfather to the Syrian synagogue. So I, you know, I grew up in both these worlds. And uh, and and Rabbi Mario was very, uh, you know, his his message was very, very compelling. The mixture of prayer and community and, and social justice and um, and he was very passionate and very authentic. You know, he had a, his devotion was very authentic. He was very outspoken. He was very charismatic. And so I, you know, I was very uh, uh, taken by him. And and uh, and eventually, when I was seventeen years old, I I wanted to I went to study with him. He had a rabbinical seminary that he had founded. And I went to, you know, to study there I, while I started university. I was the, sort of, you know, in university and then studying there in the in the evenings. And um, and that's how my career started. I I uh, I hadn't decided that I wanted to be a rabbi then, but but I think somewhere inside I I knew this is the path that I that I wanted for myself. And um, what prompted you to? to do that continued study at the Jewish Theological Seminary. So Why? I studied, so I, I studied uh, I, you know, I went to university, I studied chemistry, actually, you know, I went to university in Argentina, you had, there, there was no, it wasn't like a liberal arts uh, type of um, um, a framework, it was, you had to choose, you know, which uh, career you wanted to, what you wanted to study, physics, mathematics, architecture, engineering, philosophy, literature, and I chose chemistry because I liked science at the time. And then eventually there was some political turmoil in Argentina, the university was closed for a number of months, and, uh, and, and um, it was very... Uh, traveling and uh, I I didn't want to remain there. And so with my parents' support, I went to study, I went to Montreal because I knew I knew French. I didn't know English. In Montreal, there was a you know French speaking university in Mont in Quebec, I mean in, in the city of Montreal. And I went to study there. And um and there was a, an incredible for me Jewish experience because and Montreal has a very active Jewish community, and I was able to, I was very, very um, uh, hungry for Jewish experience and for experiencing variety of, you know, things. So I went to conservative, reconstructionist, orthodox, uh, Chabad. I went to study to, in a Chabad yeshiva three times a week. I went to, uh, you know, after, after school, after the university, I mean, like, you know, in the evening, I went to Moroccan services and I was, I couldn't have enough, 
you know, of, of that. And so after I was graduated there, I went to study to in Jerusalem for a year. I was presumably I wanted to, I went to do a master's in chemistry. But when I got there and I did the uh, Hebrew Ulpan class during the summer, so I, I was able to already be conversant in Hebrew and reading and so on. Uh, I started looking at the offerings in the university and I saw great teachers of, of Jewish thought and Bible and and Talmud. And I, I said, why am I studying chemistry? My heart is, you know, over here. So I, I spoke with a professor who was assigned to me, you know, as in my in the chemistry, in the master's. And he was uh, actually a, a, a religious man from Hungary. And he understood that, you know, what I was thirsty for. And he says, don't worry, you're in Jerusalem. Go study Jewish studies. And you'll come here to the lab. I'll teach you a couple of techniques. I'll give you the stipend. And you go and study. Uh, it's a unique opportunity for you. He was very supportive, which was incredible. And and that was it, you know. I and then I went back to Argentina, and um, and you know the program in Argentina is very very lengthy because people are studying their own careers, you know, university at the same time. So the studies at the seminary are are part time, so they're very prolonged for many many years. And I wanted to have something that was more consistent, that was concentrated, that was uh, well organized. The seminary at the time in Argentina didn't have many professors, and I wanted something more structured. And uh, and so I came to the seminary in 19, in January of 1982. So there's so much that I would want to explore with you, but I keep one eye on the clock. Yeah, And I know that, I mean, I would love to hear more about what surprised you about JTS, but I'm going to have to move forward because of the time to say that when you finished in 1986, upon graduating, you chose to join your mentor, uh, Rabbi Marshall Meyer at B'nai Jeshurun. And I did a little research this morning. I see that historically, B'nai Jeshurun was founded in 1825 as the first Ashkenazic synagogue in New York, a breakaway from Sharet Israel, the Spartak synagogue. Right. 1986, you go to B'nai Jeshurun to join your mentor. What, what um, led to that decision? What was the choice that you were making? So look, when I was at the at the seminary uh, in in uh, 1985, so as a I as I was about to start my senior year, uh, and you and I were already classmates at the time, because uh, you had come from Los Angeles, right, at the time. That's right. Yes. So I was entering my senior year, and uh, Marshall came to this synagogue. He actually wrote to me before coming, and he said, "Go and check it out." You know, there's a synagogue on 88th Street. I'm invited to, I'm being invited to become the rabbi there. Go and find out what's going on and let me know. So, you know, I came to find out and this place was totally bankrupt. Uh, the, the the place was in shambles, the physical space. The, there was a small minion that wasn't even meeting in the synagogue. I wrote him back and he said, you're crazy. I mean, this place is like, it, it's it's destroyed. He says, well, exactly. That's what I like. I like a challenge. And uh, and we're, I'm going to go there and try to build back this congregation. So he came here in 1985 in August. And my wife and I started coming to services to support. We lived in the neighborhood. We prayed in a different synagogue. There was no minion here. So we started coming down to from 110th Street to 88th Street to, to, to su support what was happening here. And there was a small group of people. Sometimes there was no minion, so we made the minion. We were members of every single committee. You know, uh, there was an education committee, social justice committee, and I mean, I and uh, except for the finance committee, I was members of. You know, we were members of all the other committees. It was a very small group of people. It was a startup, BJ. And uh, eventually, uh, 
slowly, slowly, the congregation started growing. And my wife was in graduate school. And I needed to stay in New York for a few more years until she finished graduate school. And I was looking for a job. And I was looking for a part-time job so that I could study, uh, start a doctorate and do a part-time job. And I called Marshall and I said, you know, there's a job as a, as a youth director in the synagogue in Riverdale. The good news is it doesn't involve Shabbat, so I can keep coming to BJ. And he says, no, 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 no. You can't work in another. So you, ha you have to work with me. I said, you don't even have a hundred families. They're not going to hire me. No, 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 no. Let me just, uh, just tell them to wait in Riverdale uh, until you hear from me. He called me literally half an hour later. And he says, it's done. I said, it's done what? He says, we're going to work together. I, I said, what did you tell them? You know, I need somebody young. We have bar mitzvahs. We need a Torah reader. We need this. We need that. The congregation is going to grow. And I told them, I need you. And would you start half time? I said, I'll be delighted. So I started in 1986. You know, I was an insider because I every, every I knew everybody. Everybody knew me, and I was fresh out of the seminary. And I started working with him, and it was the greatest blessing because I had a mentor all the time with me. My my teacher, my mentor. I was working with him. I was learning everything from him, and uh, and I had the great blessing and privilege of. Um, not only learning from him, but also working at his side and building with him the beginning or the new beginning for this congregation. And, you know, unfortunately, he died uh, seven and a half years later after I started working with him. Uh, he died of cancer very, very quickly. And 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 I stayed. Um, uh, during the time you were together, B'nai Jeshurun grew very quickly. And part of that rise was the use of music, the use of music and Shabbat services. And it was at a time in which the dividing line between conservative and reform was the use of instrumental music. And right. one of the things that you and, and Rabbi Meyer um, led the way with was using musical instruments as part of services. Talk a little bit about being on the cutting edge of music and how important that was to the growth of B'nai Jeshurun. So when I grew, grew up in Argentina in his congregation, he had an organ. You know, some American congregations also had organs. German congregations had organs. and But the organ was employed there uh, in a little bit more, um, I would say, not in a very classic or old-fashioned way. It was a little bit more, a little bit more uh, upbeat. Uh, and so when Marshall came here, he wanted to have the same type of a, of a sound. He felt that the music, the keyboard, the organ supported the prayer experience, you know, encouraged people to participate and made it more beautiful. He was uh, an opera lover. He was a music lover. He had a very, very uh, developed uh, musical uh, sensitivity. And, and, uh, and so we started actually with an organ here. And then we went into keyboard. Uh, after he died, um, I was, uh, you know, I was very much into world music. I listened to a lot of world music. And, um, in the, you know, in the 90s, he died in 93. And I, I wanted to bring more of a world music type of sound to BJ. So instead of having just a keyboard, I uh, invited a couple of other musicians. We put drums, guitar, cello, flute. Sometimes we had Arabic flute. Sometimes we had the Arabic lute. You know, a variety of instruments. And, um, and the sound became a little bit more complex, uh, uh, less churchy, less uh, also keyboardy. Uh, and... Um, uh, and more like world music, you could hear sounds of, I don't know, different parts of the world, you know, in these instruments, particularly with the drums, you could do different things. And uh, it was very well received. And um, um, and I think it generated a lot of, you know, it sort of elevated the, the prayer experience and the music. And, um, and, and, and BJ became identified with hundreds of people, particularly on Friday night, 
drawn right. in part to the music. I know colleagues would refer to BJ Envy uh -huh. in terms of the crowds that would come infused by the music and that would lead to dancing as well. Talk about the the dancing that was well, added to the, the dancing. The dancing started. Uh, most people don't know the story. You know, one day uh, it was May nineteenth, nineteen ninety one. I know the date, May 19, 1991. And Marshall was still alive. Marshall is still alive. And uh, it was a Shabbat morning. And the custodian who you would take care of the synagogue came to open the, open the sanctuary that Shabbat morning and found that on the bima, and there was a very high bima, right? Which we no longer have. And the bima, you know, the, the place was of a very high bima and lots of pews. And um, uh, it, there was rubble on the floor. There was, a, there was a plaster ceiling that collapsed and chunks of plaster, very, very he uh, heavy chunks of plaster were all over the bima and the front row. And um, um, of, of course, you know, we couldn't come into the synagogue. It was, was very dangerous. And we, that morning, we were able to have access to the gym or multi-purpose room of the Heschel School, which was around the corner. It, the Heschel School operated in what had been the BJ Community House, which BJ was bankrupt before Marshall came and sold the building to the Heschel School. So we were able to gain access to that, uh, to that room. It's a big room. Uh, like a ballroom, then it also served as a gym and so on. And we brought chairs in there. We brought the uh, uh, Torah scroll. And uh, and Sidurim, everybody walked out of the synagogue with a Sidur in hand, a Talit in hand, and went around the corner. And we started the service at uh, half an hour later, 45 minutes later that morning. And when uh, uh, at some point in the service, the marshal turned to people and said, "You know, you realize that uh, we could have we could have had a tragedy because if the collapse of the ceiling would have happened during the time when people were there, people were having aliot, people, were, you know, there was actually a baby naming that morning, so a family coming with a baby. If it had happened at that moment, it would have been a great tragedy. And this is not a tragedy; it's just a ceiling collapse, and we'll figure it out. And we have to be happy." that that actually nobody was hurt and we started singing and when we started singing people started getting up and started dancing and and then we had a service the next uh, friday night and the same thing people got up and started dancing and that became like a weekly a weekly thing you know that then became associated with shabbat and celebration of shabbat and the joy of shabbat and when and we sang, you know, we we danced during Lechadodi, but it started actually as a as a spontaneous expression of gratitude and joy that, in spite of the ceiling collapse, nobody had been harmed. And so we moved. Uh, so that happened in May. We went throughout the summer. We prayed in that uh, in that room on, on the third floor, and then we uh, we were invited by a neighboring church to come and pray in their space. We had been already doing some uh, programs with that church and developing a relationship and a friendship with them. And on Monday after the collapse, the collapse happened on a Friday night to Saturday morning. On Monday, they called the pastors and said, we'd like to offer a space for you to pray in. And so uh, I, it's a long story, but I will make it short. We moved there in September, and we were there for over 25 years in that space. And that's where the congregation really grew. And, and that's where there was space there for dancing on Friday nights, and that's where the congregation really took off. And it took how long to rebuild your sanctuary? So it, it, it took only a few years. It took uh, five and a half years to rebuild the sanctuary. But by the time we wanted to come back we didn't have enough space for all the things that were happening 
outside of the main prayer service we have services for families and and you know for different ch children a a ages of children and we had also uh kiddush and things like that we didn't have enough space in our sanctuary because we had sold the community house and so we stayed in the church and we didn't have on friday night we had two services there in the church one back to back because we didn't have enough space so so we couldn't come back to our synagogue for for quite a number of years how many family units are now members of of bj i think 1750 a little 1750 over families yeah. so yeah, households many... households some households. are people who are alone singles uh, people uh we have uh, couples yeah uh, we have families with children and so uh, for for many of your colleagues like myself bj is a exemplar a role model of vitality so of services of social action and of courage courage and dealing with difficult issues and again knowing time is limited i want to touch on the intermarriage issue and then i want to return to music and what's distinctive about what i experienced in your sanctuary and then we'll open up to some questions and answers so five years ago your community completed a intensive study of how to meet the challenge of Jewish, non-Jewish intermarriage. In preparing for our conversation, I read some of the interviews with you and was deeply moved by the seriousness of the preparation in reaching a decision. T tell us about the challenge, the decision, and the process. Uh, happily. So you know we started becoming a we you know over the years people would call and and say you know would you uh, do a marriage a jewish person a non-jewish person would always say no uh but then uh, uh kids who grew up in this community you know were already in their 20s and early 30s but grew up here they started approaching us and and we would send them to a rabbi who would do the you know who, who would do the ceremony for them because we wouldn't do it and so uh, my colleagues and I wouldn't do it. So these kids, one of them came back or a couple of them came back and said, look, you send us to another rabbi. The rabbi is very nice and very kind, but we have nothing to do with that rabbi. We didn't grow up in that congregation. We have no relationship. We have a relationship with you. And, you know, I went to college. This particular young man said, I went to college. I fell in love with this woman. Uh, we share the same values. You taught us in this congregation that every person is valuable for who they are, as long as you know they have the right values and and so on. And 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 I I I, I just this is the person I love. And um, and we had a conversation with this young man. And then another person came. We had another conversation. We started realizing that uh, there's something here, you know, uh, that. It's happening. We can't avoid it. We can't put our head in the sand. We can't send these people elsewhere. We have to deal with it. We we didn't know exactly what it would mean ultimately. I I, I was not in favor of intermarriages, but I knew that uh, my colleagues and I knew that we we had to we had to deal with this. So um, I was able to. Uh, bring together a group of uh, conservative rabbis to talk about this and I was able to generate uh, a group uh, of um, scholars connected to the Hartman Institute who would um, study this issue from a historical textual sociological halachic uh, perspective these scholars would uh, study this issue and then the rabbis would have conversations amongst themselves about you know this issue and then we would bring the two groups together the Hartman scholars and the rabbis which we did and we spent a two or three days of very intensive study and um, 
and and it was very very revelatory about some of the things that came out you know from from that study together and gave some sense that there's some openings you know that there it, it's not it's not a binary it's not yes or no and Jewish identity is not a binary. It's not either you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. There were a lot of there was a lot of fluidity. There was a spectrum upon which Jewish identity happened, even historically, not just now. So we started seeing things like that, you know, um, and 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 also we started halachic decisions made by people, you know, even in the 19th century who dealt with issues, complicated issues about intermarriage, who were very courageous and were uh, able to uh, again to see an opening you know and walk through and um, and we started seeing these things so we created a process for the congregation that uh, we took our congregation and ourselves together on a on a on a journey for one year and the journey was to study with these scholars to study these texts to study the history the halachic uh, you know decisions and so on and so forth the sociology and at the same time we had a process of conversation and deliberation all sorts of presentations outside of the scholars even by members of the congregation who were for and who were against and who had personal experience and so on and at the end of this year we came we the rabbis came to uh, we deliberated and we came to the conclusion that um, we were more interested in having Jewish homes than in having two Jews marry. That it was more important for us to have people create Jewish homes than to have two Jews marry who there is no guarantee that they will have a Jewish home. It was more important for us to create Jewish uh, you know, Jewish homes with Jewish content, with Shabbat, with Chagim, with with Jewish books, with connection to Jewish community, with connection to Israel. And if there were people in that household that were not Jewish but were committed to having a Jewish home, that for us would be, um, you know, would would be a good sign, would be a positive sign. And so we came down with a decision that. Um, we would do the wedding between a Jew and a non-Jewish person as long as the couple would be committed to establishing a Jewish home, to have a connection to Jewish community, and to raising Jewish children. Including that if the mother was not Jewish, that the children would be converted at infancy. And if so the couple, we would go through a process with the couple examining these issues, and if the couple said, yes, we are committed to this, then we would then we would do the wedding for the sake of enabling them to have a Jewish home. And together with this, we made the decision that we would create a project at BJ called the Jewish Home Project that would support such couples. And any couples, Jewish, 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 non-Jewish, any family that wants to have a Jewish home, create a Jewish home and strengthen a Jewish home, we would give all the resources that these people need in order to create Jewish homes. So that was the decision. So I hope in the, we're gonna open it up after this last little piece that I have with you now, that there can be some follow-up in terms of the impact of this decision five years later now, and how you feel about it. Again, so much I would like to dig deeper in so with I'll, you. I'll just tell you very briefly. Yeah. This is not, this is not uh, intermarriage wholesale because yeah. it's very specific for couples who want to to go this way you know for whom a Jewish home is important so it's not like we've done tons of such weddings we've done few but they're very intentional and very you know we spend with we work with a couple you know for a year for nine months you know with and accompanying them in exploring all the uh, components of a Jewish home, you know, what makes for a home to be a Jewish home. And so we explore all these things with them for, for a long time, you know. So on, on, on one foot, because I want to explore the last piece, which is music in your synagogue and, can, and our theme of eternal moments. Um, 
Has it been a positive experience for you as a rabbi? Very, very, very. It's been very liberating. And it's very been very positive. Uh, because, you know, before I had to tell people, no, I can't do it. I won't do it. I can't do it. I had people who walked away very disappointed. But yeah. now there's a potential to engage people. Yeah. You know, to engage. Now, if, if uh, I mean, if the couple says, no, no, we don't want to have a Jewish home, then I'm not the rabbi for you. If two Jews come and say, uh, we want to get married, but we don't want to have a Jewish home, then I'm not the rabbi for you. Yeah. Well, that that is um, very enriching on many levels for me as a rabbi to hear, because here, too, you were, if you will, on the cusp, violating a rabbinical assembly rule. And doing... I had to leave the rabbinical assembly. They asked me to, they asked me to leave and I left, unfortunately, because I, I invited them to have the conversation within the rabbinical assembly to keep in people like me and to have the conversation within the yeah. rabbinical assembly to give options to rabbis who are dealing with this thing day in and day out. And they said no. And, and I said, okay. So that's an act of courage of the most spiritual kind that you took in making that decision, which I honor as a colleague. Yeah, so but I, I wanna... you know, um, the decision is not so courageous. It, it's, a, it's about a certain clarity. I work for the Jewish people and for my congregation, for my congregation first and for the Jewish people, not for the rabbinical assembly. This yeah. is who I work for. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu is my employer. So yeah. I, you know, I don't, I'm in the rabbinical assembly and I parted ways amicably. So I'm fully identified with that uh, hierarchy of uh, responsibility. Yeah. Literally to respond is responsibility. So when I was in your synagogue, this recent Sukkot, I was first taken by the beauty of the sanctuary. It's a yeah. jewel. It's filled with color, craftsmanship, and a feeling of elevation in so many ways. And I was deeply moved by the distinctiveness of the Spartic sounding music, musical instruments and the sound. In fact, on Sukkot, you introduced a piyut, a liturgical poem that was Indian and Ethiopian in its oh, origin. Indian, Indian and in Afghani. Afghanistan, that's what I meant yeah. to say. Indian and Afghanistanian. And so the closing image was sharing the sukkah on the roof of your building, um, a New York experience where you got to go to the roof of the building to yes. have the sukkah. And unlike California, not with palm fronds, but with uh, evergreens. And you were getting ready to do the wedding for your daughter, one of your two daughters, the first of the two. And you were going to sing to her a piyut. And since the theme is creating eternal moments, perhaps this is personal, but I'm curious. Tell me about singing the piyut under the chuppah oh, uh for your daughter. So I decided to sing a different piyut than the one we had discussed. Oh. Um, I decided to sing Yedid Nefesh and the mm. last stanza of Yedid Nefesh because, I mean, the words are, are not just between, uh, you know, a human being and God, but also between two human beings. And um, and so I ended up singing um, Yedid Nefesh and... Uh, Anyway, but yes, I mean, the music here, we tried, you know, because of my Sephardic uh, origins and also because I've been involved for uh, over 15 years in this project of Piyut, you know, of Jewish liturgy, global Jewish music. Um, very, very rich, very diverse. So bringing music from all over the Jewish, um, the Jewish diaspora the Jewish, or every place where Jews have lived. So uh, it's very, very rich. And it also gives a lot of different opportunities for expression, expression of different emotions that if you take the Ashkenazic music traditions, because there's more than one, there's Polish, there's German, there's, it's, a, it's a narrower slice. If you open it up, you know, to North African, to Middle Eastern, to Balkans, 
to even to Indian, to Persian, there's more opportunity for express, like having a wider palette of colors for the expression of prayer. And so, and also these poems are just magnificent poems. You know, the Hebrew, this, this Hebrew poetry is magnificent. So I started, uh, I fell in love with this and I started, I've been working uh, for many years. We're now finishing a book. My, my friend in Israel and I, Yair Harel and I, finishing a book of uh, 70 Piyutim that will have Hebrew English transliteration uh, and, uh, and and musical notation and a brief introduction for each Piyut. So we'll have Piyutim for Shabbat, for the holidays, for life cycle, for the home. So in anticipation of our meeting, I spoke with Ari Katz about the book that is forthcoming, and I hope to have the the privilege of interviewing you and your heir Harel more focused on PU team. We had a we had a uh, we, there was a conference on contemporary PU two or three weeks ago at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis with scholars and researchers and also practitioners. And we did a concert called Global Piyut Music in a theater in Minneapolis, not in a Jewish, not in a congregation, in a theater where Jews and non-Jews came and it's out there. It's, it's, it's world music. It happens to be Jewish music, but it's, you know, it's, it's together with other musics from the world. So it's, it was really very exciting. So I'm going to pull this piece of our conversation together, regrettably, regrettably, because again, I'm always aware of how much more I would want to explore with you. But with the forthcoming book, that will be an opportunity. The nature of these kinds of conversations is always to make it more of a group conversation. And so in that regard, I leave the 10-15 minutes left for some participation and I again turn it over to you, Ari, as the facilitator to open more broadly the conversation. Thank you. And thank you, Rabbi Roli, for your time. So I see people have already started chat questions to me, and I'm just trying to open the chat so other people can see what the questions look like, not just me. So now it's open. Um, first, the people are, are very interested to know more about your Jewish home project because they want to have uh, access to it, not as... Um, intermarried couples, but as people who want to build Jewish homes and they want to get these resources. So I assume that you're very, that these are accessible to people and um, should be accessible to people who want to build Jewish homes, not just in the context of coming to you with uh, intermarriage. Is that, so is that material available? And um, so can I share with people? So try to go to the BJ website and put in the, in the search Jewish home projects and see what comes up there. Okay, but it sounds like something that all couples should do. And um, yeah, I mean, we've we've done a number of uh, we've put together a number of resources. We have also we have classes, introduction to Judaism classes. We have a podcasts and all sorts of things that we've done, and we continue to do in order to empower people to create Jewish homes. And of course, the meetings with the rabbis, you know, uh, for these couples one on one, have been very uh, important, you know, for these people. Right. And, and um, people have asked, uh, can they get a copy of Raleigh's, Raleigh's playlist? So if you don't have one, we have to create a playlist. I don't have a playlist. Okay. So you and I have to create a playlist of some of your favorite of things. Yeah. Oh, we have to, we can, we can create it very easy. I do that all the time. Um, and in the context of, of, of the playlist and music, you, I, I briefly mentioned before COVID, you'd have one Friday night a month. I think it was dedicated to an alternative Friday night. Can you talk about what that was like and how you now yes. do that in the, in your um, online world? So that was a, an attempt to, we did it over a number of years to bring more of a Sephardic Mizrahi piyut flavor to the service. Uh, you know, there are a number of people in the congregation who don't necessarily respond to that, who, uh, you know, who wanted m m the the cl classic uh, BJ service that we offer most Friday nights, you know, or every Friday night. So people didn't necessarily uh, want to up for that. So we created an option for people who really wanted that and who wanted to experience a little bit different music, who wanted to uh, learn some not only music, but also some of these PU teams, some of the texts, and 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 give the service a little bit of a different flavor. And uh, it was also more intimate, you know, for people who wanted to be in a room with, we had 80 to 100 people, 
most, I think uh, we had is probably 120 people. So it was more intimate, uh, more connected. Uh, uh, I felt more connection with people. We were in a smaller room, people with each other, with the music. So it was a, uh, you know, it was a, uh, I, I really enjoyed that uh, very much. Um, the format was different. I was sitting instead of standing at a, at a Bima, you know, um, so more informal in that sense. So, so now you, but you don't do that now. Do you incorporate those no. aspects of the Pew team now? I mean, I, I watch your service enough. I know you have, you change melody. So do you include yeah. new Pew so, team now and then yeah, in your so services? From time, to time we, from time to time, we incorporate some of this Pew team into the service. What happened is that with COVID, you know, first of all, services were entirely virtual for a, for a long time. And then when we started coming back, it was smaller and smaller number. I mean, smaller numbers than before. We are still not where we were before COVID in terms of attendance in person. So to have an alternative service, it would, you know, create, uh, as you know, it, it would deplete, it would sort of, you know, take take apart the small number of people who are there on a Friday night. So where were, on average before COVID, how many people would attend a Friday night and how many attend three, now? Three, four hundred on a Friday night. And, and now? And now maybe a hundred. Now we have twice a month, we have actually families with kids who come to the first part of the service, Kabbalah Shabbat, until after the Hadodi, and then they leave for for dinner, you know, that this, this is families uh, with, with young kids. So on two Shabbatot a month, we have about, you know, a hundred extra people, families and kids, plus the, I don't know, 75 to a hundred people who are there on a regular Shabbat. So it's, it's a couple of hundred. Pally and Katz asked a great question, and it's something that, that I've always wondered since I watch you guys. You have three, you have a davening team, and you have three people up there all the time. Um, and I notice you also rotate because you depend, you, it's not always the same three people, although, yeah, it's not always the same three people. You rotate. And her question is, how do you coordinate the music and coordinate the services? Do you guys know each other so well that you basically just show up on Friday night or Shabbat morning and it's ready to go? Or do you, do you really sit down each Shabbat and coordinate everything you're going to do for that Shabbat? How do you, how do you? No, the way it works is that we, we, we have, we meet, this prayer team meets once a month. And we talk about all the issues that come up, the challenges, the things that work, the things that don't work, things we want to change. And um, and um, and then we have a little bit of a rehearsal for things that needed, either things that are new or things that need to be tightened. We have a little bit of a rehearsal. And then each week on Tuesday or Wednesday, we get the, our music director, Dan Nadel, he sends a proposed uh, um, sort of path for the service with the melodies that are proposed. Mm -hmm. And then we comment, maybe on the Shabbat, we shouldn't do this melody, even we should do another melody for X, Y, or Z reason, right? And so we all agree at some point, there's a, there's a, a, a proposal that is accepted by, every, by everybody. And then on Friday night, we have a sheet uh, with us that says that we've decided that for Yedid Nefesh, this melody, for Lechun Eranina, this melody, and so on and so forth. And sometimes we make changes at the last minute. Mm -hmm. But basically that's how and, it works. And when people watch, if you haven't watched, watch a service. It does seem seamless. And it's what's incredible is... We have a way is, to rotate. You know? Yes. We have a way to... We know who's first, second, third, you know. Right. Sometimes and, somebody jumps who wants to, who feels particularly inspired to, you know, to start. Uh, so, and then the per next person picks it up. And so it's like, we know each other. We've been doing this for a long time. So I want to talk about your team. So you have this davening team um, and you've had interns over the year that come through and go out. And I, it seems to me that this your con this concept that may have come from Rabbi Marshall Miller, I don't know where the davening team came from and where maybe, maybe that's your innovation, but it's certainly something that I see as coming from B'nai Jesh and is now popping up in different places around the country. So Rabbi Sharon Browse has her Ikar davening team. Um, right. CBI, we've got a davening team. Can you talk about this davening team concept and maybe some of your interns that we should very, know about? It started very naturally, you know, because uh, so Marshall and I were two people and there was somebody and Ari, our Hazan was at the keyboard at some point. So the three of us sing and we like to sing and we like to sing together. And so we started just doing the three of us. And then when he passed away, then 
my colleague Marcelo came, and then we had fellows, and then we had Felicia. So there's always people coming in, and we we didn't like the model where the rabbi sits down or stands and announces pages and is not engaged fully in the in participating in leading the davening and the chazan does solos, you know. So we feel like there, it, it's more dynamic. And so it started very naturally. We didn't have a prayer team. It was just three people praying. And then eventually we learned that uh, some other congregations called it prayer team. So we started calling it prayer team. But it's like, you know, it's us like davening. And, um, and it's, it, it, um, you know, it, the rabbi, it, many congregations, the rabbi just announces pages or is sitting down on the side. But we wanted to model for the congregation that people should be engaged. You know that this is a moment to be, prayer services to be taken very seriously and to be very actively engaged in the prayer. And we take turns. It's, it's prayer is not a solo thing. It's community. So we're modeling for the, for the rest of the community that we, we're praying together. We are, we are the prayer team is not just the three or four people on the Vima. The prayer team is everybody's the prayer team. We together, the whole congregation is the prayer team. We happen to be sort of the captain of the team, if you will, or the leaders, but everybody is part of the team. And we have lots of people on who have said they found you now. I have to leave in just a couple of minutes because I have a meeting right. at four. We, I have one last question, then Rabbi Spitz has a question. So when you're not davening at B'nai Jershurun uh, um, on a Shabbat, is there a particular place that you go to daven in, the, in New yeah. York? So, so uh, yes, I, I go to places, you know, because I'm Sephardic, I miss sometimes the, 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 the Sephardic uh, flavor. So I go to a Syrian synagogue on the east side or I go to a Moroccan synagogue here on the Upper West Side. So, um, you know, it, it's more of a, a familiar type of a, it's not just the music, it's also the dynamic of the prayer. Of yeah. course, it's not an egalitarian service. And so I, I, you know, I'm a little conflicted about that, but, but, uh, you know, but that's where I go. Rabbi but Spitz, go sorry. See what's oh. going on in other places, yeah. I'm just going to pull this together. Eileen, I know on the chat, asked for you to sing. I know you're not going to get a chance to now because it's almost, it's four o'clock now for yeah. your next meeting. But I will say to everybody, you sing in a way that is beautiful and it's worth coming to B'nai Jeshurun to join you in song. And uh, you sing so well, so Thank beautifully. You so Thank, you. Thank you so much. I'm, it's the, very generous. The closing question may have to wait for the Piyut conversation because it was going to be, since the theme was creating eternal moments, what is a image of an eternal moment that you have had recently that um, gives you goosebumps? Look, I, I mean, I think that some of the moments on on the high holidays, you know, when there's oh, everybody's there and everybody's very connected and very um, um, thirsty for that moment, for that connection. We know we can't let it pass, you know, because then you have to wait another year, you know, for a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and people are really, really, really there, very present. Um, it's it's very meaningful and very beautiful, and so some moments here and there on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur have stayed with me also on Sukkot, you know, these things that are, Shabbat comes every week and, and all, and there are eternal moments, but, but these Hagim, you know, which are, are, are more rare, uh, some of the moments there are just, you know, just linger and, 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 and are nourishing for the rest of the year, you know, the memory of those moments, the imprint of those moments in the heart of a connection of entire community in search you know, in search, in elevation, those moments are just, you know, just amazing. Well, thank I, you. I want to say thank you as well thank for you so much. this thank conversation you. because you've created in ways you wouldn't anticipate it. Goosebumps for many of us that are also um, profound connection. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm very honored. And, um, and thank you. Ellie and Ari, and, uh, and hopefully soon we'll have this book ready. We'll, and, we'll, be, uh, we'll be ready for you, and we'd like to do a program dedicated to the so Piute much. with you. So Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. See you thank soon. You, thank you. And um, 
Lots more coming up with CSP. Take care. Thank you, Rabbi Spitz. And good to see all of you from you. Michigan, New York, Canada, and um, Scandinavia. Take care, buddy. Be safe. Be healthy. I, Irene Lancaster, nice to see you as well. Bye-bye, everybody.